Hello, everyone. Welcome to Reset with Raven, the channel for hope, inspiration, faith, and stories of renewal, rebirth, restoration, and of course, reset. Today, I am sure you will be blessed by the story of Danair Marie Puller. Danair is an educator, an advocate against domestic violence, author of Run For Your Life from Victim to Victor, an inspirational speaker, a former iHeartRadio show host and entrepreneur, and most importantly, a child of the king. Daenerys is an overcomer and an exemplary of resilience, courage, and triumph. Through her story, the lives of millions of women have been changed and continue to be changed, including mine. Please welcome Denaire Marie Puller. Good morning to you, Raven. I am excited to, you know, be on your show today. And um, I just hope that what we are doing here today will educate and also inspire people to see this thing, right? Domestic violence through a new lens. Absolutely. I'm so happy and honored to have you today. So we will jump right into your story. So Daenerys, I know the world needs to hear your story of reset. So please start by sharing with us what events in your life led up to you needing a reset. Well, the first thing that took place, you know, Raven, I was raised in a very religious household. And I came from a background where we put God first. My mother was very spiritual and I learned a lot of things in my household that I did not know would impact me as I went into my adulthood. Um, ultimately, that led me to a situation that I could not run from. It became part of my DNA. Ultimately, I became a victim of domestic violence. But Raven, I didn't know what that was. So let me just pause one second and just let everyone know what domestic violence entails, right? Because I felt like I didn't look like a victim. I didn't feel like a victim. I wasn't afraid. I wasn't crying in the corner. And domestic violence is really a pattern of abusive behavior in any relationship, right? And it can encompass physical, sexual, emotional, economical, psychological actions that actually impact another person. And so really that's what was taking place in my relationship. And I just felt like it had a strong hold on me. But so it was very confusing because this thing, I didn't know what it was, right? And the person that was victimizing me, I love the person. We had some children together. Um, I knew him from a child, but he wasn't always that way. He was loving kind. He was the uh, financial person that took care of our household. So this sent very confusing messages to, uh, do I leave? Do I stay? He's sorry. It's not happening every day. And so there are many layers encompassing this thing called domestic violence. Wow. So you talked about being able to identify domestic violence. For someone who is confused or is wondering, hey, are these type of behaviors domestic violence? What, what could be some red flags? What could they do to um, better identify or understanding, hey, the way I'm being treated, whether it be physically, emotionally, or both, are not what I should be expecting out of my partner? Well, a lot of times it's hard for you to even identify that there's a problem because you're isolated. So the person that you feel loves you, the person that, uh, you know, that you're in this union with, right? Your partner, uh, intimate partner, the person that you probably spend more time than with anyone else is sending you mis messages. So sometimes you don't even realize how your self-esteem is going down and 
everything that you feel you know about yourself, little by little is being taken away from you. So abuse is not so much about physical hitting. It is about power and control. And when this other person is pretty much uh, telling you uh, how you should be, how you should cook, how you should dress, how you should behave, you start questioning your own identity. You start questioning who you were raised to be. You start questioning the person that you see in the mirror every single day. So some of those things, those lines become very blurred, right? And you don't even realize that you're not the person that you used to be. And not only that, we see so many images of abuse in society, on television. You know, we see misogyny everywhere we go, where we shop, right? So now you're like, is it me? Or is there a problem or there's no problem, right? So you get to be very, um, you lose confidence in yourself. And so that's what began to happen to me. Every day, a small part of myself was dying. So a way that you can counter that, right, is the first thing you have to do and what I had to do, Raven, is I had to own the problem. I had to realize that the problem just wasn't with the person that was abusing me. The problem also was me. You know, that I wasn't standing up for the near. I wasn't giving myself the love and self-care that I needed. But sometimes so many years can go by, you lose yourself. Right. So it's it's healthy when you actually share healthy conversations with people. You put healthy things into your mind. You use positive words, listen to positive music, right? Even gospel music. And you know, the Bible says sometimes you gotta encourage yourself. But sometimes this can take years for this to happen. Sometimes someone is dependent on someone because of finances, right? Um, if you have small children or uh, you don't have any place to leave or your education has been halted because of this abuse, because what happens, it causes a domino downward spiral in your life. One of the things that you just said about being careful what you allow in your life, I was just reading something yesterday and it said, actually it was by Robin Sharma. He's a leadership expert. And he says, don't be a trash can. And I was like, oh, what does he mean by that? He says, don't let anything dump in you. Don't let any type of music, any type of television, media, um, voices, conversations, movies, anything that does not lift you up, anything that does not grow you as a person, don't allow yourself to be a trash can for your atmosphere and for people. So you talked about self-awareness because I really want to know what led, what, what clicked for you, for you to be able to have that reset. You're on the other side of it now, but Thank what God. led to, what led up to that? And what was that thing that was like, oh, okay, I got to run now. This no more, it's now or never. So most people that end up being victims in relationships, right? It's something that's holding them there, right? Whether it's finances or this or that or shelter. And for me, the primary thing that kept me in the relationship was I was in love with the idea of family. You know, a husband, a wife, two children. And that's exactly what my family looked like. But on the outside, for people looking in, it looked very good. But being on the inside, it was very dysfunctional. But even when you're in a dysfunctional relationship, that dysfunction becomes part of your normal everyday life. And for me, I always wanted my children to be in the same household with their dad. But ultimately what happened was the same reason I stayed, which was for my children, right? And then I was even told that I was the person that was breaking up the family. I was told, so now there's some guilt that's put on me, right? And um, not to even mention, thus save the Lord and the whole, you know, uh, everything that's on you from Bible believers, right? And people that you grew up with in church, you know, we have this thing about women submitting, right? But that's not how God wants us to be. So the very same reason why I stayed was the same reason that I felt I had to leave.
So there was a situation where there was an altercation in the home and my children witnessed it. Um, ultimately, the police was called and I too was taken away in handcuffs in front of my children and I spent 72 hours in jail. So if my mom hadn't come there just before the police arrived, my children would have been put into the foster care system and I would have had to fight to get my children. So this was one of the straws that broke the camel's back for me and it opened my eyes in a brand new way. And I said, this thing has got to be bigger than myself. You know, I realized that my children were also victims, secondary victims. They weren't physically being hit, but every single thing that they witnessed between myself and their father ultimately became shackles on them as well. You know, their, their schoolwork began to falter. Um, they began to have other habits that was unhealthy that I noticed. And I said, you know what, if not me, who's gonna be the person that breaks this cycle of violence in our family. And so I made the decision that I would leave because I had left before, but this time I would leave and run, not just for my life, but for my children's life as well. That's something that I really admire about you. And I can tell that family is super important to, important to you. And one of the quotes that I love from your book is that you said, and it stood out to me, when you've had enough and you're almost out of options, you have a decision to make. Yes. And it sounds like for you, that decision was, I have to get out. I have to run. I have to do what's best for my family and for my children. And one of the things that I also want to discuss is because family is so important to you, where was your family in all of this? So I, I know your children were secondary victims, but your siblings, your mother, you know, were they aware um, when they found out or how, how are they feeling? Were you uh, hiding this from them? Where, what role did they play? Because I know they have a very um, uh, interesting and beautiful introduction in the in the beginning of your book. So talk to us more about where were your brothers, your your mother, where were they when all of this was going on and how did they feel? Were you hiding and, and in shame from them? Raven, I was completely living a double life. I mean, I wore a mask every single day. As strong and courageous as I was to the world, I was broken inside. And so I kept this from my family. Um, I never let them know what was going on. Years had passed and many victims do that. And what they end up doing is protecting the person by default that is abusive to them. And they use that same power and control over them because it's such an embarrassing um, weight that's on your shoulder. You don't wanna let someone know that I am a victim or I am, you know, being uh, in a situation where, you know, I don't seem as strong. I don't seem as powerful. Matter of fact, you don't even look smart. Right. You mm. feel you feel low. Right. You feel dumb. You don't feel empowered. Right. And so that wasn't something that I wanted to share with anyone. As a matter of fact, I thought that I actually could control the situation. But the situation became larger than myself, right? Because one, I told you I got arrested, right? I ended up in jail. And, and you know uh, what they always say on the airplane, right? If the plane begins to go down, right? You can't save anyone else. I couldn't mm. even save my children. I couldn't even save myself, right? So I had to stop, right? Pause, put the oxygen mask over my own face, right? Inhale, exhale, breathe and reassess and even reset in the situation in my life. So once I told them, you know, they became very broken. And, and honestly, I didn't tell them the entire story until I wrote my book almost 20 years later. Wow. Wow. Yeah, I, I love that um, analogy you make about um, being on the plane and making sure you're putting your own oxygen mask on before you put those of the people around you or your children. Right. And I would say you can't pour from an empty cup. 
You sure like you can't be you can't be a hundred percent for others if you haven't taken care of you. And that's that self-love, that self-care, that self-awareness to know, you know what, right now is not a good time for me. Right now I'm not at my best. And let me take some time to refuel, recharge, and replenish myself so that I can give freely and give with a good heart and be 100% for everyone else. So one of the things that um, I think our viewers would love to know, so you ran, now what? So you left, then what? How, how did how did you regroup from that? What did I you do? All over again. I had to leave possessions. I had to leave education. I had to leave job. I had to leave everything that was familiar to me. And even if you look, I even had to rename myself, right? So even when I wrote my book, I had to change my name from who I was because this person, that other person was shackled, shackled. That person was broken. That person was misguided, right? So I had to re-educate myself, right? I had to change my environment. And sometimes you have to do that. You have to totally remove yourself from everything negative, everything you knew, everything that was dysfunctional and retrain and reteach yourself, right? So that you can start making healthy decisions because many of us know what's wrong, but we don't know how to get to what is right, right? How do I find a healthy relationship? How do I learn how to speak differently, walk differently, talk differently, and even command the respect that I know that I now deserve, right? So even that took time, right? And initially when I first left those set of that first set of situation, I didn't automatically make healthy choices, right? I didn't automatically go get counseling for myself because now I'm in survival mode. I had to learn how to go from two incomes to one. I had to go from having two parents in the household to one, two people paying for groceries and car notes and mortgages and things of that nature. And now I became the sole source of income for my family. So I immediately dove into survival mode to make sure that I was taking care of my responsibilities with my children. And that's what happens with a lot of women, right? And men too, they also get abused, right? But now I'm left with a new set of circumstances that I've never dealt with before, right? I was never a single mother before. I was never the sole source. So I went from working two jobs, taking care of my children, um, became a homeowner, bought a new car, right? I went right into survival mode, but I still, again, was taking care of everyone else but me. And that's how I end up making the same bad decisions again. So you say, what do you mean by that, Dania? After everything you went through, a broken, raggedy relationship after 10 years and you still can't get it right? You ever see uh, situations and you go, well, how did that person get re-victimized again? How did that, yeah, how did that happen again? Did you right? think, didn't you learn from the first time? Right. And you know what, women, we can be our worst enemies to each other, right? Because we end up telling the women that, right? But we don't know how to counsel and advise people, right? So we have to go to professionals. And so years passed and I wasn't dating a lot, right? Because I was throwing myself into my work, you know, activities in my church, doing homeless activities, um, making sure I was active at all of my children's school activities, right? But so I wasn't dating that much. So when I did begin dating, I wasn't making the best choices. People that had my very best interest in mind. As a matter of fact, I started thinking that I could help and nurture people that I felt was broken. Right? So, your complex, huh? Oh, yes, yes, yes. So remember I talked about that mask, right? So I hadn't fully had that mask on tight enough, right? Air was seeping out. I was losing oxygen, right? And then I slipped back into my same way because most people that are um, perpetrators, right, or that are abusers, they bring their garbage, their baggage, their, their post-traumatic stress disorder, and they pour it out on you. Maybe so you a trash can. can. What? Right, I'm a trash can. And so I find myself in another unhealthy relationship. There was no hitting. Remember I said uh, abuse doesn't always have hitting involved, right? But this individual was calling me a lot. You know, they were coming into my workplace uninvited, even dropping off food. And that may seem like it's good at some point. 
But when the person is um, stepping over boundaries and, and not giving you your proper space, I felt like this was a strangling situation for me. And I broke off the relationship after nine months. But during that time, I was breaking up with the individual almost every other week for nine months. Ultimately, I told this individual my birthday was coming. And I said, you know what? There was no argument. I thought it was amicable. I said, I cannot take you into another year of my life. Well, a week passed. I thought everything was fine. The person comes, shows up to my house, holds me hostage, strangles me. And here I find myself again trying to survive. Right. Thank God he restored me. He brought me back. And I could not let the story in there. I said, what if that was the last breath that I would have ever taken, Raven? What wow. would life have meant? What would that dash have meant, right? That little bit of little line that we have in between our birth date and our death date, right? So I had to do something different. And that was change my entire mindset you know, um, re-educate myself. I became certified in domestic violence, right? I began to learn more about it. I began to educate other people about it. And this time I was not going to let my abuser get away with what happened, right? So I became a witness for the state. This person ultimately served eight years in jail and I had to move the needle forward, right? As embarrassed and humiliating as it was, right? Even with this gap of 20 years in between, I had to make a difference, not just for people that are victims or survivors now of domestic violence, but anyone that is going through any obstacle or storm in their life, and they don't know how to move away from it. They don't know how to get over it. They don't know how to move under it, right? We got to keep pushing forward. We've got to learn how to uh, exercise self-care and, and be the person, right? Or be the person in the mirror that we want to come and rescue us, right? And so we've got to create our own narrative. And with God's help, you can do it. I love that. One of the things that's coming to my mind, though, for anyone who's watching and says, Daenerys, you are so strong and I am so encouraged by you. However, what do I do if I don't feel that strength? Or what do I do if I have so much fear? What message do you have for someone who's listening, who's thinking, I, I don't feel as strong as you, or I can't go down to one income, or I don't know what to do. What, what, what would you say to that person watching on the other side of the, of the screen? I would say that your victory is on the other side and you almost have to be like a caterpillar that goes through a cocoon, right? Mm -hmm. And it's uncomfortable. You have to reshape, you have to reform, right? You have to convert from who you are to who you wanna be. No, it's always not gonna be easy, but it's going to be worth it. How bad do you want it? Mm -hmm. How bad do you want to reset? How bad do you want re you know, renewed life? How bad do you want to be restored, right? And ultimately the decision is yours. It's between you and the person that you're looking at every single day, right? You have got to be your own cheerleader for your circumstances that you want in life. Wow. Ultimately, the decision is yours. I love it. I love it. That's about taking that action. Wow. So I know that you have been blessed with several resets and one of the resets in the love area and in the healthy relationships. How, how, what, what would you tell someone about being able to love again and being able to have a healthy relationship after um, having these disappointing relationships, how, how were you able to reset and say, you know what, I'm going to give love another chance. Or I'm going to allow myself to be loved the way that God intended for me to be loved. The first thing is Raven, and that's a great question. I had to feel that I was worthy of love. Mm -hmm. I had to feel like I deserve for someone to give me respect, right? pull out my chair, right? Open a car door, right? 
to allow someone else to pay for things for me, not just thinking that people wanted to take from me, right? So I had, again, to reset, right? I had been so guarded all of my life. And I have to tell you, it took me years to change my conversation, right? To not be so sensitive, to not be so uh, anxious or quick with words, right? I had to learn how to listen to people when they spoke to me. And I had to learn how to give different responses. And when that came, when I was ready, it wasn't that I had to look. Love was already there waiting for me. Oh, I love that. So when you change, when you change your story, when you change your words, when you change how you saw things, yes. you realize that love was already there. Already there, girl. That oh, was, that's was, so good. Like, that's so I good. I love flowers differently. I walk differently. I smile differently. And it I became a whole new individual. And I always love to tell people, thank God I don't look like what I've been through. And it's okay to tell your story, ladies, right? Or men, or guess what? It's okay not to tell your story until you're ready. Walk in your greatness today. God has a better plan for your life than you can ever imagine. Woo, he dropping, dropping some wisdom on us right now. Well, I want to thank you so much for your time. So um, before I ask my last question, where can we find you online and tell us about how we can get your book? Okay. So you can find my book at Amazon, Books A Million, Walmart.com. The name of the book again is Run For Your Life From Victim to Victor. And remember, this is not just a story of domestic violence, but this is the story of overcoming, right? Moving those mountains out of your way. So you can reach me, you know, through denaremarie.com. You can reach me through my email, um, denarelaw at gmail.com. Um, you can reach me on Facebook. You can reach me on Instagram. I'm trying to become more a uh, social media friendly, right? But ultimately, our goal is that if we can help one person change their life, right, or see this thing through a different lens, and then guess what? My living has not been in vain. Beautiful, beautiful. Final question. What's been the biggest lesson you've learned from your reset? I would have to say that I learned that I had to put me first in order for God to do the rest. Wow. You, you, you gave us a whole sermon today. So I am super, super grateful. Again, I want to thank you so much. I appreciate you, appreciate your time. I appreciate the wisdom that you shared. I appreciate everything you helped us to glean and understand about healthy relationships, self-awareness, self-care. This was wonderful and thank you so much. Thank you, Raven. Have a great day. Be blessed. So, everyone, again, Daener just dropped so many jewels and diamonds on us. And one of the things that she said that stuck out to me is no is not going to always be easy, but it's worth it. Again, this channel is for anyone who has experienced a reset or is seeking a reset. My hope is not only that you be inspired by these stories, but you be empowered to take action. And again, let me know what resonated with you most about Daenerys' story of reset. You all know I only have one ask. If you enjoy these stories of overcoming and have received one nugget, jewel, or tool for your toolbox on reset, Subscribe and share with your communities. And until next time, remember, a reset is always available to you.